gentle marketers. Welcome to episode 71 of the Gentle Business Revolution podcast, the show where we talk about marketing your business by disrupting the current marketing paradigm and changing it to a gentler approach, one that's based on empathy and kindness. As always, always, I'm Sarah Sinecroce. I'm your host here, and you know that you're in the right place if you are a heart-centered entrepreneur or change maker who is looking for a different, a better way to market your business. Or you might also be a marketing impact pioneer. So that's someone who's working in a company, maybe in the marketing department, and you're looking also for different ways to market. Today's episode falls under the P of pricing. And if you're a regular here, you know that I'm organizing the conversations around the seven P's of the gentle marketing mandala. And if you're new here and don't know what I'm talking about, you can download your one-page marketing plan with the gentle marketing version of the seven P's of marketing at sarasanacroce.com forward slash one page the number one and then the word page. It comes with seven email prompts to really help you reflect on these different P's. Today's episode, as I said, is about pricing and pricing are always uh, really popular episodes here. It's something that we're all struggling with. And I'm uh, really excited to talk to my guest today, Caroline Wood. She is an introvert who supports other introverts to build successful businesses that work for them rather than take over their lives. She does this through helping them put in place great business models, pricing, and systems to thrive. Caroline is a corporate SKP, having spent 20 years as a chartered accountant working for large businesses and not-for-profits. She has wound her way around the world, working in Australia, her home country, the UK, Namibia, and Laos. So in today's conversation, we're going to be talking about pricing for service-based businesses, working out a minimum price, how setting up business systems uh, can help you with pricing. I also talked to her about a recent blog post she posted around different business models, which really piqued my interest. So without further ado, let's talk to Caroline. Hi, Caroline. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you. How are you? I'm awesome. Thanks. Yeah, we have this big time difference, first of all, because you're in Australia and I'm in Switzerland. And we also have a seasonal difference, which I just (laughs) mentioned. So it's always fun to think, oh, what it would be like right now in summer. And I'm here in December. (laughs) Particularly Christmas. Exactly. Summer Christmas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always interesting. So today I invited you to talk about pricing. And like I kind of said offline, I noticed on the podcast downloads, pricing is always a topic that gets lots of interest, I think, because, you know, everybody, I think, as a business owner kind of struggles with that topic, but especially gentle marketers or or gentle business owners, because we're, we're, you know, we're, there's a lot of uncertainty, I think, with pricing. Am I doing it right? Uh, are people not buying because it's too expensive? Am I, you know, pricing too low? So, so many questions uh, around pricing. And and the other thing that also I share in the book is, is this idea of underselling. So it's, I'm pretty convinced that my story of underselling as a gentle marketer is is not unique. Have you heard that in your practice, Caroline, with your clients or or maybe even experienced it yourself as well? Yeah, certainly with my clients. And I know that I have definitely done it. Particularly, you know, I think when you're in the early stages of your business and you know, yeah. I you know your own stuff really well. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I know my numbers really well, but the whole marketing and that other side of the business sound is really challenging. And I think that just encourages you to not believe in yourself as much as you perhaps should because you don't understand that particular element of business, even though you're really good at what you do. So I think think we all have it, particularly at that very, you know, those first year or two of running a business. And, of course, you burn yourself out then when you don't price properly. Yeah, 
It's it's so true. It has so much to do with confidence, right? And so mm. and that's why, yeah, that's why maybe we lower our prices because we don't think our, of ourselves as being worthy, f- you know, f- for higher prices. Is that what you see as well? Yeah, I think I think as dental marketers, we tend to do that even more than perhaps other people. I don't think we're we're as good as that good at that fake it to make it mm-hmm. attitude I think that's not a gentle marketer thing I think I know personally for myself I don't want to fake it till I make it I want to offer a good service you know from the beginning people are giving me money I want it to be delivering value and be something they should you know get get the outcomes they want from what they they bought from me and I think when you're gentle, that that whole fake it stuff feels just a bit, just feels yucky and uncomfortable. Yeah. So how do we, you know, price gently or or you call your service practical prices? So how yeah. do we price our services or, or offers in a practical way, in a gentle way, without burning out? Because I think that's part of the underselling is is that if we undersell our services then we end up constantly working because we have mm. to get so many client bring in so many clients to still you know have a sustainable business so how can we you know have a sustainable business make a good income that is enough for us or or maybe a bit more than enough and 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 therefore also you know prevent the whole burnout idea and 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 really as introverts especially we need a certain quiet time and we know that you know working constantly especially with one on one clients might actually drain our energy so how do we get that balance right i mean for me it's i think when we first start out in business we have so many I think most of us have a lot of money mindset issues that we need to work through. Mm-hmm. But my big problem with that is, yes, you've got money mindset issues to work through, but you rarely solve anything mindset related quickly. So for me, it's about getting to know your numbers and having a, a system where you know how much you should be charging for each of your hours with your clients to, to make a proper proper income, you know, one that you can live off without, as you say, having to do so many one-on-one sessions that you you just burn yourself out because, as you say, as introverts or, you know, quiet, gentle marketers, you can't, you can't be talking to people all the time. You have to factor in that downtime. And part of what I do with the system I use is working out how much time you really have to work with clients uh, and how, you know, how much time you've got for client work and then working out what that would translate to as, a, as an hourly rate and that's not to say you would charge by the hour, but it's understanding understanding how that then feeds into any packages or products that you're going to price. So really, really understanding where the numbers come from first. Mm-hmm. And then also just looking at what your competitors are doing, which I know for a lot of people throws up comparisonitis. So it's, you know, when you see what others are doing, it can be quite daunting. But I think it also helps you to give a better sense of what people are actually charging in the market and, and you know, what what people are willing to pay for your kind of services. Mm-hmm. It, it sounds like there's, you know, two steps in a way to tackle pricing. One is the mental and yep. that, that doesn't necessarily need to go first, but it needs to happen either way either first or or in parallel with then your more practical approach yeah because uh, sometimes we kind of have this you know ostrich approach to numbers we just like oh let me just do the inner work and you know yeah and then from there everything will figure itself out but but you're saying no no we still need to actually look at the numbers because you know, that's in the end what we're dealing with here. Yeah. And, and so in a way, solve first or or not first, but also the mental blocks, but then also, okay, now let's look at the numbers and, and really calculate. You were talking kind of 
the way I understood it about, about a minimum price, right? Yeah. 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 So the minimum you need to be paying yourself. And I think, I mean, I think that's two of the aspects to it that you need to be working at pricing that includes paying yourself, which I think a lot of people forget about when they first start pricing. They mm-hmm. they think about the costs they've got to cover or, you know, bits and pieces without actually thinking about, okay, what what's the wage that I want to pay myself? You know, right. if you're, you're an employer, what if you're working for someone, what would you want to give yourself? And I think so a lot of people start out, you know, not thinking about, oh, this is how I'm actually going to make my income. They, they seem to have a bit of a disconnect there. But I'd also say that I think high school maths has so much to answer for when it comes to people and numbers and pricing. Like high school maths makes it really seem complex that you're going to be doing all these calculus and algebra and all sorts of other things. And and it's really quite simple numbers that you can do to work out what you should be charging people to make sure you can actually survive and hopefully thrive. Yeah, you're you're right about the high school math. I think <laughs> you know there's some people like you who are you know really just feel like okay numbers I get it uh, it's my thing, and then there is many of us, me included, who yeah <laughs> it all started during high school, and you're like well I'm I must just not be good at numbers and that's it yeah right? not yeah. realizing that well there's numbers and numbers and numbers and, and 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 here we're talking about something unrelated to algebra it's like a completely yes. different way to 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 look at numbers and and, and you kind of talked about you know pricing in the time that you spend you know, with the client, but also probably yeah. the time that you spend preparing for the time that you're going to actually see the client. So prep time. And, and, and what do you think? I heard this concept once where this guy was sharing how he's pricing and why he's charging what he's charging. And he included things like, you know, IP, intellectual property. He included experience. He included, you know, kind of mental space. <laughs> so yep. Maybe not as exact words, but he was saying, well, if I work with a client one-on-one, it's it's like I become their partner and I really spend <clears throat> time thinking about them also when I'm not working with them. And that really resonated with me. If I take on a one-on-one client, I'm like constantly thinking about them. And and when I hear a podcast, I'm like, oh, this would be good for, you know, her. And I, so what do you think about calculating some n- non-tangibles into your price as well? Yeah, I think that's really good to do. I think it's hard to do at the beginning. Yeah. So I tend not to do it with clients using the system, mm-hmm. but then I I sort of feel like because you're you're not when you do when you are starting out you are missing a lot of the the business stuff that goes around what you offer. So you may be a fantastic life coach, but maybe your onboarding isn't amazing to begin with, right? Uh, but as you as you grow and you get to understand and you talk to other people about how they do business, you know, you develop much better experiences for your clients. Mm-hmm. And that's where I, I see, you know, you start to put your prices up. So I like to start people off mainly because most of the people I see even putting their prices up to what their minimum should be completely freaks them out. So that's sort of like the next step after they've worked with me is I'm really about let's get your minimum price so that you're not completely undercharging, which so many people are. Yeah. And then we can look at <laughs> you know, putting your prices up as you get more clients, as you get more booked out and you're more in demand. And then that's when you start to factor in things like your IP, the amazing experience you deliver. And I think the experience you bring, you know, as, as you work with more and more clients, you just you just naturally know more because you've seen more situations. Yeah, and, and and I think you can really feel yourself into the client's specific mm. situation because you can compare with all these other clients you've had in the past, right? Yeah, but you should definitely be charging for, even when I talk to people about their minimum price, you should definitely be including things like prep time mm-hmm. and the follow-up you do. Like if you prepare notes after a call, then that should be factored in as work that you do. I have clients who do training for people and 
you know, they would never not include the time it takes for the, to prepare for the training because that's a huge piece of their work. And I think, you know, other service providers need to think about that as well. I think it's really a mindset shift from going, you know, from like just this hourly rate where maybe some of your old clients, if you've been in business for a while and you've we only, you know, always charge hourly, maybe they're going to transition out and it's not going to work for them if all of a sudden you're actually, you know, raising your price and saying, well, this is my new price and it includes yeah. my time spent off, you know, not, I'm not just billing for the time that we spent together, but yeah. If once you're there with this new price, I think you're going to feel much better. What I, what I noticed and I share in the underselling story is also almost like there's this frustration when working with clients and not feeling like you're getting paid well enough for the service you're, you're um, offering. You know what I mean? When, it, when it's like, I, do. I feel like I'm giving so much and yet I'm kind of stuck with this hourly price that it gets to a resentment almost yeah. towards your yeah. clients. Oh, definitely. That, that is just a shame because you're in business to, you know, to do good work and, and, and find joy and, and really delight with your clients as well. And I think you, I think the weird thing is that when you put up your prices, you tend to attract better clients. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you know, if you're too low, you get a lot of people who are bargain hunters who expect so much for what you're charging. Yeah. And that as you put your prices up, you start to work with people who are more realistic about what they're paying for. They understand contracts. Yeah, you know, they understand what you've agreed to do together. Um, their businesses tend to be, you know, if it, if you're working with people in business, their businesses tend to be further ahead. Yeah. Um, if you're charging more, you know, if you're a wellness person and you're charging more, you're probably finding you're getting people who are more committed to the process than someone who's who's only paying a really low low amount. Not always, obviously. There's some, you know, a lot of people who can't afford really high prices, but they're still really committed. But I just find that as you put your prices up at least a bit, you attract clients who actually value your work a lot more than those who are just looking for the lowest price possible. I'd agree. I noticed that whenever I had in the past, you know, had a sale on, you would get more sales, but mm. then you'd also get more problems, <laughs> meaning people were, <laughs> you know, much more picky about things and, and, and yeah, it was just like problem after problem. And, and, and mm. again, it led to frustration because I'm like, I'm giving you this great deal and, and now, you know, I end up with more problems. So obviously, yeah, it was all me because I put up the sale where maybe sales are, they're okay sometimes, but you need to be careful to not become this business who only basically sells while you have a discount or a sale on, because then yep. that also kind of impacts your your brand and, and reputation I would say yeah I think sales can work well if it's like you know I've done with that that you're part of the introvert marketing bundle where mm -hmm. they're courses that don't require the people who take part who you know offer their courses as part of the bundle to then do x you know it's no there's no one-on-one -on -one work right as part of that yeah. you know, I think sales can work yeah you know, can be okay then but I think as soon as you start discounting your price and it relates to your actual time, that's when you start to go down the slippery slope. Yeah. I mean, there's always exceptions, like if you want to do pro bono work for a charity or, you know, something, you know, a cause you really believe in, there's always, you know, you've always got exceptions to anything. But I think as a, as a general rule, I don't recommend discounting if it relates to your time. I love that, that you bring that up because, what I noticed is once you actually do make, you know, good money and you feel good about receiving the, that level of, of income, then you are much more open to then also do pro bono work for certain mm. projects that just, you know, 
bring you joy. And you're like, of yes. course, I will do this for free. Where yeah. before I found myself in this situation where it's like, I'm doing everything for free. <laughs> and so that didn't feel good anymore. But once you turned it and turn it around, you're like, I'd love to. Yes, of course. So it's a much better position to be in because naturally gentle marketers are givers. So it's not mm. the giving that we're struggling with. It's it's more the receiving. So it's really the yes. receiving, I think, that that we need to work on. Yeah. And I've seen a couple of people recently do where they've had maybe courses that have an interactive element or a group program. Mm -hmm. They've offered, say, one space for someone who you know, they charge a pay what you can rate or they give a yeah. scholarship. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really nice way to give back without devaluing your brand and who you are. Yeah. So you still get to support people and be that gentle marketer you want to be. Yeah. While not actually damaging your business at the same time. Yeah. Actually, let's talk a bit about that, that you know, pay what you can or, or pay what I, on the gentle business circle, I actually have a pay what feels good model. And I'm mm. actually, you know, saying uh, I'm testing this out because there's a lot of talk about these pay what feels good models. And, and some people will say, you know, it never works. The people are always going to choose the lowest level. And, and, uh, and other people are saying, I had a conversation with Mark Silver about this topic, who's kind of mm -hmm. made this his, his niche. And he, he says, well, you need to take enough space. That's what I remember uh, from this conversation, yep. meaning that you really need to explain your model and explain, you know, these are the ranges, but if you can afford it, I would love for you to take this middle range because that yep. really covers my costs. And, and so I don't think it's the, the fact uh, or, or it's true that these pay what feel good models don't work. I think often they're not well explained enough. Mm. Is that what, what, would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, I've seen anecdotal evidence from people who've done it and most of them have said, you know, if the price, you know, I would normally offer this is say $49 or $110 or whatever it is, mm -hmm. but, you know, please pay what you feel it's worth. And I think most people find that they actually, most people pay the price that you think, you know, if you say it's $49, Mm -hmm. That's what most people will give you because yeah. you've made the decision for them. Yeah. If you give them a guide, they don't have to go, oh, my goodness, this is worth $10 to me, $100. If yeah, you say, that's hard to figure out. Yeah. Right. yeah. If you say it's $49 normally but pay what feels good, I think most people end up paying the $49 because that's the easy decision. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I'll 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 report back after. Yeah, <laughs> interesting to hear. Yeah, I think generally people don't like making decisions. So if you give them the answer, yeah, they really like that. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, there's this saying, "Time is money." What comes mm. up for you when when you hear that? I think for me, it's that for a lot of us, time is money. We just don't realize it. I mean. I really, one of the things I really hate is the term passive income mm -hmm. because there's absolutely nothing passive about it. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, <laughs> just, so, for, you know, it's, it's how do you use your time to make money in the best way for you, I think is what it comes up for me. Uh -huh. And whether you want to pay someone else to do something so you have more time for something else. So... It's always that trade-off. I think of if you you know, if you don't have much money, then you've got time, and if you have a lot of money, then you can buy more time. That's interesting. Yeah, basically outsource and and uh, yeah, yeah. What what also comes up for me, and and I I think that also relates to to what you're offering is is systems. Because yes, I think if we put in place systems that reduces the amount of time for certain things yeah. that maybe we don't need to actually spend on if we have yes, a system definitely. in place, right? Yeah. So what, what, what are some examples of, of systems that, that you put in place or help your clients with? 
So for me, the big one is that whole onboarding process. Mm-hmm. I know when I first started out, I was spending so much time sending contracts and invoicing people. Yeah. And just by systematizing that and also having it, you know, simple things like a calendar booking system, particularly being in Australia where the time zones are always a nightmare, has made such a difference for me because it means that the time we've agreed to meet, we both know what time it is, we're both in the right time zone, I'm not waiting around for someone or they're not waiting around for me for half an hour because we've messed up, (laughs) you know, what zone we're in or... Yeah, yeah. So even just simple things like that can make such a big difference to to how much other time you've got in your business. I say getting my contracts, set, template contracts set up and in a system where I just type in people's names and press a button has been, you know, life-changing in a lot of ways. Yeah. No, I mean, if you would have to draft that contract every time, you know, by hand and then back and forth yeah. and scan it and whatnot yeah it's a lot of admin time that you can save yourself definitely yeah yeah and the setup doesn't take that long I think we put it off because the setup we think it's going to be complicated and the setup will be hard and you know it's not easy but once it's up and running it's up and running and oftentimes you can you can hire a VA to do that kind of thing for you really quickly it's kind of an investment you do once and then it's yeah. set for life. Yes. Yeah. 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 I I I often share about this for my podcast because a podcast is you know so much re- repetitive tasks mm. and I like I really automized the heck out of it and, and <laughs> so that I only get to spend the, the, the joyful part, you know, you get to do the joyful part, which is having the conversations and then everything else. It's just like, it's a system, it's a process. My VAs know what to do. And, and so that feels really good because I knew if I was going to do this podcast and it will take me, you know, hours, like you hear people say, it's, it's a good three yeah. hour job for each episode. And, and that just, didn't feel good to me. I was like, that's going to make me want to stop the whole thing. And so we really worked hard on that <laughs> process. Yeah. I think as introverts, we sometimes don't realize how draining, draining it is to deal with things like emails. Yeah. So you're not on a call and you're not talking to someone, but it's still that interaction and having to think about responses that I think takes a lot of us who are introverts a lot more time to to do than perhaps someone who just shoots off quick replies. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's true. It's (laughs) true. It can take me like half hour to write two lines Yeah, because I'm always putting myself in the receiver's place and, and think, well, does that sound good? Is that, you know, gentle? Does that come over as, you know, pushy or, or, (laughs) Like it can take a lot of time to just, yeah, come up with a yes. simple reply. And, and then you have to have a nap afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to hear I'm not the only one. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> I want to address another one of your strengths, which is business models and kind yep. of how they relate to, to pricing. You wrote a blog recently, and we'll link to it in the show notes, where you talked yep. about building your business your way. And so yep. obviously that really resonates. And, and then you explain the four different business models. So would you please kind of explain those to our listeners and, and then kind of explain how they relate to pricing? Yep. So this really came, I started really thinking about it when I was running, as part of running the Introvert Marketing Bundle Mm -hmm. and how, you know, I'm making, you know, I'm making money off other people's knowledge and products that they've developed. And I, I really started thinking about that whole knowledge piece and how you can, knowledge and time and how you can leverage that differently to grow your business. Maybe I, I want to just uh, pause you yep. there and, and why don't you explain that bundle uh, in a bit more details? Yep. Yeah, so with the bundle I get together, I think last time it was about 13 people, mm-hmm. 13 people who offer courses that aren't, you know, massively expensive 
and I bring everyone together. Um, that everyone offers their course, we package it up and we sell it to other people for $99. And everyone gets an affiliate link and if they sell the bundle, they get a certain amount of money and I get to, you know, I keep a certain amount of money for organising the bundle and doing the, I tend to do all the, I prepare all the marketing collateral and the emails and stuff that people can use so it's a really easy thing for them to take part in. So, yeah, it's really about bringing together all these different people's courses and then packaging them up together at a really good price. And I went with marketing because that's not one of my strengths and I know for a lot of my introvert clients marketing is one of the things they really struggle with. So it's a great way for me to be able to offer marketing support for the introverts in my audience that who mm. I can't help. So it was a really, for me, it was a really lovely way to be able to help them at it's a, a win-win really win. price. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It goes and back to the you know, business models. Yeah. So I was thinking about that and how knowledge and time, and I came up with a, what I thought there were four different options and depending on how much is one-on-one, basically one-on-one time versus knowledge and whose knowledge and time you're leveraging. So one option is that you leverage your time, which is really about one-on-one services and then high-end group programs where you have a lot of one-on-one contact and it takes up a lot of your time. It's not something that you can, you know, you have to be present. It's you delivering the service. Mm-hmm. And then the other side of that is where you leverage more of your knowledge than your time and it's things like online courses where you might, st- you know, you'll still be there, you're still maybe contributing in a Facebook group, but it's not the same intensity as the first option. And then because of the bundle, I started thinking about, well, you also leverage other people's time. And so that high-end one-on-one service then becomes more of an agency model where you're hiring people who then deliver that one-on-one service to your clients. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of businesses do that and they don't call it an agency. But, you know, it'd be like a gym where you get personal assistants, personal trainers in rather to to also train your clients. And then the final model is the introvert marketing bundle where you're really leveraging other people's knowledge. And the other options other than bundles are things like, you know, you might be an affiliate for a program so you make affiliate money income or you're seeing it more and more now with people organising summits and selling VIP passes at the end. Right, yeah. So they're sort of the four options. Mm. And I think it's about thinking about who you want to serve and how you want to serve them is what affects which model you pick. But obviously pricing also comes into that, particularly in terms of who you want to serve So to really scale that one-on-one, you either have to go with the agency model, and if you don't want to do that, then you have to do high-end client work if you're really wanting to make serious money Mm -hmm. that you can't. You have to charge more per hour than normal, whereas with an online course, the pricing is much more flexible. You can, you know, if you're not heavily involved in the delivery all the time, then you can have a price, your price at lower and probably serve more people and also serve people who can't afford that high-end service. Right. And then the last two options are similar again, but it's about leveraging other people's knowledge, I guess. So the pricing is still the same in the two models, but then it's about who actually delivers the information. Yeah, that's so interesting. I I had never thought about it like that I I guess also because if I had to for my business pick one of them I have like one in each corner (laughs) so I kind of like to mix and match and I guess that applies because I have you know 12 plus years experience yeah Uh, if you're first starting out I, I I like the idea of kind of picking one and then making that your focus for maybe, you know, at least two years and, and kind yes. of building in, in that corner. And then why not? Yes, then pick another one from another yeah. corner and, and kind of expand. Is yeah. that kind of also what you 
what you're seeing because you're not only you're also working one on one with clients and and yes. you have the affiliate model so it's kind of a mix and match as well yeah and i think the affiliate model is easier to integrate into that one on one work than perhaps the others are yeah true in terms of having to develop a lot of content so it's probably an easier second choice if that's you know if you want to add a little bit more in i agree because you know what we hear everywhere online is that you have to have your own online course mm. and that you're going to make millions with that online course. <laughs> but the, the, the truth is, is that creating an online course, like you say, is much more work than maybe selling other people's courses. Yes. Um, and, and yes, maybe you're going to be making lots of money, but maybe not, you know? Yes. So, so I, I like this idea of, well, you don't have to necessarily have your own online course. Why not you know, use other people's know-how and and kind of partner with them and 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 yeah, really affiliate marketing kind of got a bad reputation because mm. it can be uh, very pushy. But if you do it the gentle way, it's beautiful partnerships that can happen. Like that's how you and I met. I was part of yeah. your introvert marketing bundle, and 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 now you know we're doing this together. So it it really depends on how you approach it and. If you do it well, affiliate marketing can be a great additional income to your... Um... Yeah. And I think, you know, say for me, it was also about being able to offer people in my audience something that I couldn't do. Exactly. So that, yeah. you know, particularly with marketing where there is so much That's so bad true. extrovert advice out there. Yeah. 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 So yeah. it's how do you find the right people to help your audience or the right products? Mm. I think if you come from a place of service with affiliate marketing, it's a it's a really good experience for both sides. Yeah, exactly. It's it's not about the always maximizing, but it's about mm. who can I can I put my audience in touch with who will yeah. have the same values and you know who they will align with. Yeah. So I really like that approach. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I think a lot of it's about service. <laughs> exactly. In the end, it's all it's it always comes back to that. It's so yeah. Mm. We could keep on going. I, I would have yes. more questions, but I think <laughs> we've got to wrap it up here. And so I'd like to always I always ask a last question. What are you grateful for today, Caroline? I think for me it's and I've been this has been for most of most of this year, I've been really grateful that I work from home and that I have my own business. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I mean, obviously always grateful for family and friends and probably don't say that enough, but for me it's really been that I have this opportunity to work from home mm. and in a setting that I feel comfortable in. And I think as I've been really, I think because it's been such a long year and I'm really tired at the moment anyway, being able to work from home this week before Christmas has just been very fabulous for my soul. Yeah. A lot of love goes out to our extroverts who, who yes. probably <laughs> kind of suffered a bit on a different level than than us introverts. But I'm with you. I'm grateful to be able to work from home. Mm. Do you tell us where people can find you in order to, you know, find out more about you or work with you on on their pricing? So my website is quietlyextraordinary.com and I think I'm on nearly all the social media platforms as Quietly Caroline. So mainly Instagram probably at the moment, but that's, okay. that's just, yeah, I'm trying to cut back on my number of platforms. So probably Instagram and I'm at Quietly Caroline. Wonderful. We'll make sure we put those in the show notes. Thank you so much for this quietly wonderful conversation, (laughs) Caroline. Thank you for having me. It's been lovely to talk to you. Thank you. I hope you learned a lot on this uh, conversation around pricing. Uh, Please go check out uh, Caroline's website if you need more help around this topic. She's at quietlyextraordinary.com and you'll also find all the links and resources we mentioned at sarasnacroce.com forward slash gbr71 
Also, if your intuition tells you that now is the time to join the Gentle Business Circle, our monthly explorations of gentle marketing and gentle business, then don't miss the deadline to join us for our next call on February 10th. We get together every month and really create change as a community. If you join now, there's still time to submit a marketing question as well that we can then discuss. We're now about 20 plus people in our little gentle marketer group. And besides the main group, we also get to share and be heard and hear each other's perspective in the different breakout rooms. You can find out more and sign up at sarasanacroce.com forward slash circle and choose the monthly price that feels good to you and suits your current budget. Next Friday, I'm back with an interview around the topic of email marketing, the gentle way. Don't miss it. Let's be the change we want to see in the world. Take care.